Matthew chapter 5 <coughs> down at verse 7 there's a change of style here previously we've been uh, thinking of our uh, attitude to God and, and God's relationship to us and now we turn to uh, put into practice or uh, get, get out of our bloodstream into action what the Lord has been uh, teaching us and making possible by his grace and so in verse 7 <coughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Anybody here not obtain mercy? I was thinking of David's psalm, Psalm 51, he says, Thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. And there is no substitute, if you are unmerciful to others, then the word of God says that God in that great day will be unmerciful to us. Again, as this amazing sermon says, with what measure you meet, it shall be meted unto you again. This, I was going to say string of commandments, but they're hardly that, in one sense they are, but these exaltations to me, they're, they're rather like a, a string of gems. I remember being down in an island off the, uh, in Kerizawa. Uh, it's an island which I think was established by the Dutch. It's between, it's just off the coast of Venezuela, or Venezuela, whichever way you pronounce it. And I remember the main street there was all jewelers' shops because um, watches and other very expensive jewels are cheaper there they, they, there isn't the government tax on them and so I went into a shop not to buy anything but to see how they operated and it was very very fascinating to see how people came in to buy different kinds of jewels now I, I, I don't know what your choice would be in these beatitudes you know blessed are the poor, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart uh, there's a whole string of them and I found in that shop, as I did a little eavesdropping and looked around at these sparkling gems and so forth, that they, uh, it, it was all done with very immaculately dressed people and uh, the benches usually, you know, nice black velvet because that gives the reflection from the lights and you see everything, every jewel at its best. Well, lady, can I show you some diamonds? No, 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 I don't want diamonds. Emeralds. I'm only interested in emeralds. And uh, another counter, well, could I show you some emeralds or, or, or pearls? Oh, no, 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 rubies, rubies. All I do is buy rubies. And so everybody seemed to have a, a pet, uh, even in stones, not pet rocks like they were selling a few years ago, but uh, a favorite stone. And uh, I guess that you could select one of these beatitudes and say, this is my, my favorite. I wonder which it would be. Now again, you, you can't take just one of these attitudes by itself, they, they've got to be strung together. And, and it's my conviction that they're in sequence. Uh, as I said before, if we began at the end and said, blessed are the pure in heart, if we put that first, we all gasp and say, well, there's not much hope for me. But it starts at the foundation, instead of saying, blessed are the pure, it says, blessed are the poor. Well, except we have a very inordinate amount of pride in us, I'm sure that we can, uh, again, um, identify with that. We are poor in spirit. The classical case to me is the, is the psalmist David, where he says over and over again in his psalms, um, well, as he says, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. Or again, um, he brought me up out of a horrible pit. I, I was poor. Bow down on you and him, he and poor and needy. He says that more than once. He recognizes that in the sight of God that he is he's just nothing. He's a kind of a zero. You've got to start off there. That's the only place if you're going to start climbing, if you're going to build, you've got to excavate first. And the excavation is to recognize that we're nothing. And, and we're undone in the sight of God. You may be socially high up, you may be financially well here. You may be intellectually well endowed, but that gives you no start when it comes down to the place of, uh, uh, of reconciliation to God. After all, I guess there's no greater intellect, at least in my judgment, than, than the Apostle Paul. <coughs> and yet he, he admitted later in his life that, that he was poor and needy. 
Now, now this uh, beatitude, blessed are the merciful, follows immediately after, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they should be filled. Filled with what? Well, filled with righteousness. And if they're filled with righteousness, then they're going to be in, uh, just as a, a wall, you test the wall with a plumb line and you see if it's correct or it's incorrect. But the plumb line here is the righteousness of God which has been made well in us. And the outflow should be that we're merciful, we have received mercy. And therefore, though we did not re deserve mercy, we received mercy. And therefore, we should ourselves uh, give mercy to others. We talk these days a great deal about disposition. One of the great classic scholars was a man by the name of Cicero, and he said there's nothing more suited to a great man, an illustrious man, than a merciful disposition. We don't live in a world that's uh, really very long on mercy. It's very long on cruelty right now. It's very long on injustice. It lacks, it lacks mercy because it lacks compassion and it lacks love. Have you noticed how seldom anybody mentions the mercy of God? We mention the love of God, and sure we should. There are not many humans that have mercy in it. They, they have love and God's kindness. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith. Well, then there's no mercy in that. Yet it's all embodied in that, in that one phrase, love. Because I'm quite sure that if we, if we love, as God loved us, then the overflow of that love will be mercy. Again, the, other, uh, the, the, uh, the previous Beatitudes are related to ourselves and to God. This is something going out now to the other fellow. Mercy, in my judgment, is pity in action. It differs from grace. Grace uh, implies guilt and uh, through the grace of God we receive pardon. Mercy means that they're, they're, they're in, uh, there's somebody inferior, there's somebody that we could, uh, you know, work something out over. And, and God didn't need to have mercy on us. His justice would have been all we needed because, after all, we were uh, in sinners, we were guilty. And yet the outflow of love, because God is love, God is, is mercy, merciful. And this very book says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, look at Ephesians, the, the, the second chapter, uh, a minute. Ephesians 2, let me get this on this page here. Okay. This three says, among whom also, pardon me, verse 2. Now let's go back to this. <laughs> get it in reverse. <clears throat> and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Now, that's you. He, he doesn't say us, he says you. <coughs> you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. In the second verse, he says, we're in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all have. Now it's God himself. In the second verse it's ye, in the third verse it's we. Had our conversation. Now that doesn't mean talk, it means our manner of life. That's the old English translation, they put that a word in there that isn't uh, totally the best, I guess. Among whom also we all had our manner of life in the times past. This was our manner of life, lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and of my nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us when we were dead in trespasses and in sin. Now again, God did not need to come to our situation. We have transgressed, we have broken every law, I doubt, it could be possible, but I, I doubt if anybody yields to Jesus Christ the very first time that they heard his name, particularly in a country like this, or England or somewhere else. In heathen countries, yes, in our country, one of the old hymns says, I have long withstood his grace, 
long provoked him to his face, would not hearken to his call, grieved him by a thousand faults. That said, mercy, can I be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God is wrath forbear me, the chief of sinners spare? Again, I've long missed to this place. I had, I was raised in a, a very fine Christian home. There were Bibles all over the place. There, were, there has been Christian literature all over the place. And yet for years and years I, I was saved, and just before I was fifteen, fourteen and a half to be, to be precise about it. And you see, a, 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 the mercy of God, I, I think that this is the most amazing thing to me almost every day, that God puts up with the rebellion of the human race. There's no way you can interpret life anywhere in any, when you talk about the planet Earth, whatever phase of you're on the planet Earth, there's no way you can interpret modern life as getting better and better and better. They said, they said when I was a little boy, well, you see, war, this is the first world war, and be very happy about it, it's the last one. There'll never be another world war. No, well, that was 1919, 20 years after 1939, we we're back into another world war, more terrible than the First World War. And uh, we've just invented more and more uh, diabolical weapons, not of mercy, but suffering. We even have schools to teach mercy. We, we have schools to train soldiers. We have, we have science giving hours. They, they, they work 24 hours a day in the laboratories of the, of the world to find new inventions of, that are more merciless than ever. I, uh, you'll hardly remember, but uh, Life magazine showed, uh, before it went out of print, obviously, that they showed children being baptized in Vietnam when we were, when we were chasing the enemy. And we sprayed them with a, with a mustard gas that it brings a big blister and all the skin comes off and the children look like little raw tomatoes running around. Now, no skin on them. Now, that wasn't the Russians doing it, we did it. As Christian people, we did it, so-called Christian nation. The others were inventing diabolical things. But God is rich in mercy. Um, let me look at another scripture here. 1 Timothy... Excuse me, 1 Timothy 1.13, I guess. Verse 12 says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy. I think that that thing gripped the heart of the apostle all his life. He obtained mercy. You can't buy it. It's given by, by grace. It's given by the graciousness. It's given by love. And if you remember when he stands before a grip of that in the 26th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, I don't think he's boasting of his wicked career, but he's making us see the transforming power of God. He's talking about a man who was, uh, well, a grip who was the last of the Jewish kings, the first was Saul, the king of Israel, the last one, and when he, you talk about psychology and smartness, read the 24th chapter where he's before Festus, then he's before Felix. In the 26th chapter he says, uh, King of Gifford believeth thou the prophets before he can say yes, he says, I know about believers. Why? Because he'd been raised up in a Jewish home, he'd been raised up where the law was taught. And he can drive down heavily on him there to show him that he was the same breed of person, if you have to use that word, or nation of person. And then he goes through, he says, listen, I was an evil doer. I, I handed men and women to prison. I, 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 I chased them into strange cities. In other words, he broke up homes. He broke up lives, he persecuted them. Uh, he said that's the right thing to do and they were stoning Stephen. And yet God has turned that man around. One of the most amazing, not perhaps the most amazing conversion in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, this man had a volcano for a heart. He didn't know anything about grace. He didn't know anything about mercy. He didn't know anything about gentleness. He was full of revenge and bitterness and strife. Isn't it amazing that a man whose hands were running with blood, a man who had put many people in prison, a man who had driven people into strange cities, out of their homes, out of the cities, into other lands, is it fantastic that a man like that could write 1 Corinthians 13? 
the most beautiful poem ever written. You can talk of Charles Wesley, and I like Charles Wesley very much, and Cowper, and Madame Guillaume, and all the rest of them. But nobody has written anything comparable to 1 Corinthians 13. In fact, I was thinking tonight, you'll be very smart if you all memorized it. <coughs> and if you memorize it in Moffat's translation. He, he, he turns words around a little bit, but he gets them right up to date. Love suffers long in this kind. Love endeth not, love wanteth not itself. And he says, love is never rude, love is never resentful, love is never selfish, love is never glad when others go wrong. Do you like to see somebody stumble because it makes you feel taller? Do you like to see somebody stumble because, well, they deserve it anyhow, I knew it was coming. Uh, do, do you rejoice over the fact that they make a, make a slip or a slide? Or are you very merciful and say, well, uh, they'll go either for the grace of God. I'm sorry that happened, and I want to tell you that uh, if our positions were reversed, I'd be very glad for you to come and show some mercy to me. Or, or do you take side with the crowd, as most, most people do, and say, well, you deserve it anyhow, you have it coming. You see, that, that, that's the very last thing that, that, that mercy would do. Now we think of the classic case. I suppose it's a classic case in the, in, in the scripture, and, and that is, of course, the case of the Good Samaritan. What does it say? It says that the Samaritan went and showed mercy unto him. Now, let's get this simple thing very clear. I, I think it helped me today to realize this. You can talk about doctrine. You can't talk about mercy. Mercy is something we do. Mercy is pity in action. Mercy is compassion. Doctrine is something we stir up in our heads. I don't know what you've got in your, in your head. If you, if you took an examination, I guess I could find out, took some tests. Uh, and you can work next to somebody and not know that then they have some little strange quirk of doctrine and they say, well, it's, I'll be smart not to say anything while I'm here or in some other group. They, this, this group don't believe in this. But, I wouldn't be around you uh, a week before I discover whether you have mercy and compassion. It's something you can't hide. You can't hide it if you have it. And you sure can't hide it if you don't have it. <laughs> it's very obvious both ways. And that is the world looking for. Not more, is it looking for more judgment? Surely it's looking for more mercy. Now, there's a very incisive word there in, in, in James. James is very tactical. Martin Luther said that, 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 that the epistle of James is an epistle of straw. I, I don't know how in the world he got that. I find the epistle of James has really got some teeth in it. Supposing I, I, I said, now everybody close your eyes, uh, everybody uh, just take a piece of paper and a pencil and you write the uh, definition of, um, of godliness in, um, in less than a hundred words. Now that is a true Christian life. Well, you might say to be filled with love. It would be interesting to find that answer. James puts it down and he says, pure religion and undefiled before God is what? You know what he says? That it, it's to love God with all your heart and, and it's to visit the orphan and the widow and have compassion on those in need. That is a biblical definition of what true religion is. It's not, not I fast twice in the week, Lord, listen, you know, the man that went up in the temple and he went up to the front and he lifted up his voice and then he lifted up all his virtues and he made a really good job of it. Well, when he came out of that temple, he was ten feet tall and fifty inches round the chest and he felt he was the greatest guy in the world. But the man with God's voice, was, apparently God's ear was leading to the man that got compassion from God well, the man that's not his best, I, I don't think he's still up at the front. I think he got behind the little big pillars in the temple and ashamed and embarrassed. God being merciful to me, a sinner. What did he want? He wanted mercy. He knew he needed mercy. The other man didn't need mercy because he had no consciousness of, of wrongdoing, no consciousness of sin. Now again, if you read on into the next chapter of, of this marvelous Sermon on the Mount, it says, With what measure ye meet, it should be meted unto you again. Okay, look at James chapter 2 here. 
James chapter 2. And verse 13. Here's a, here's a summary for you. There's not, there's no classical summary anywhere else, anywhere near to this. One of the great fathers in the church, that Chris Austin said, Dost thou desire to receive mercy? Then show mercy to thy neighbor. Which is only an echo again of what the scripture says. Look at uh, James chapter 2 and verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy, but has shown no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. He shall have judgment without mercy, but has showed no mercy. Now, does that mean just on this level? Does it mean if I'm unmerciful to you that it's just going to go around and come back and bang? When I'm in a state of need, the, 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 the same mercilessness that I viewed someone else's situation with, the same merciless conversation that I uh, gossip I had about them, it's going to come back to me, and it won't just come back to me, it will come back with a compounded interest. Or does it mean in our, my attitude to my fellow believer that as merciless as I am with others, one day at the end of the journey, God is going to judge me with as little mercy that I have had in judging other people. Now that, that's pretty tough, isn't it? We shall have judgment without mercy, that has shown no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. The question is this, what well, if somebody that you, you've dealt with, you know that, that, okay, they've done something wrong, they, they've defrauded you, they've done some other thing, and they get into a bottleneck where, where you have the power over them. Now what do you say? You say, well, I'm going to be real just about this. Boy, I, I think it's about time this thing was put straight. Or are you going to take again the other side and say, well, look, we're all fallible, we all make mistakes. Now, it's not that we're going to cover up sin because love is just as well as merciful. But, you know, it, it all depends. Now, it's not what you do, it's not what you say, so much it's, it's how we do it. But really nothing. Think of a classic case. You remember the story where, uh, when David said he was hunted by Saul like a partridge? You see these little things on the roadside, the quail, and uh, they don't have much defense. They're certainly not eagles. They don't have great big claws. They don't have big beaks that can tear something else. They're, they're pretty helpless things. And David says, well, I was just a kind of a refugee. I had a handful of people. Saul had his big armies, Saul had all the power, Saul had all the authority, Saul had sent out his watchmen, everybody's looking behind every rock trying to find me. And uh, I don't know how smart he, well, how he did it, but remember he managed to go into a cave. I think he knew the track, you know, there weren't many roads in those days, in fact there hadn't any. But they were just beaten paths over the mountain and, and maybe he'd stayed there in that cave before and uh, he goes in the cave and says, well, we'll have a nice quiet night here. And before long he hears a tramping of feet and he looks out and who comes in but his greatest enemy, King Saul. <coughs> and Saul got down, I don't know whether they had any straw or what in the world they had, but <coughs> he got down there and before long he was tired out, he went to sleep and his soldiers went to sleep. And all the other guys with David said, there you are, you see. I can imagine them saying, you see how the Lord delivered him into your hand? This is the night. Get rid of him. After all, that's what he's going to do to you tomorrow if he catches you. And here you've got him asleep. Just go up and <laughs> sleep his stuff. But what did David do? David was already anointed. The minister of King Saul was passing. He could have rationalized it and said, well, I guess, I guess you're right. I guess, I guess, because I've already been anointed, this is a chance to get rid of him anyway and start all over again for the whole kingdom. It'd be better for everybody. No, no, what did he do? Well, the king wore a tunic. So he goes up and gets over the tunic and he cuts a nice piece off it. I'm sure he could enough have to notice he'd missed it. He, he would miss it. And in the morning he was up there, they went across the valley and they hollered and hollered and hollered and 
Somebody came out and said, Your Majesty, uh, the man that we're after is not far away. There he is. He's howling with the rest of his men. Come out. Come on. Bring your, bring your bodyguard with you. Now, look. Who is this? This. this. Oh. Do you remember the scripture says that they, um, oh, they put purple, uh, a robe of purple on Jesus? It, it says there were two men, a rich man and a poor man. The poor man died and was carried. I like that. The rich man died and was buried. They knew the difference. But the rich man lived in purple and fine linen every day. You know, I, I think sometimes we read the Bible as though it says that this man changed his coat and, and he kind of jumped on his camel and went to see his robot to see what was inside. Or this woman made a garment or something. I, do, you, do you ever realize, you know, the length of the tabernacle in the wilderness? It, what we need had walls, say, I don't know the exact height, say six feet, and they were made of linen. Uh, and, and every thread was put in by hand. Ever thought of that? There's no machinery. They, they made frames, and they, and they put that they put that stuff in. It must have taken years and years. The same was true when you when you bought a piece of cloth. And only wealthy people had cloth that was dyed. I remember being in North India once, and I wanted to go in Nepal just to say I'd been in. So we crossed the the, the bridge, if it was a bridge. <laughs> It was kind of shaky and, and uh, looked like old railroad ties and the rushing river underneath, you know, you kept your head up and walked like this, you kept looking down and up. But, but we went in, as we went in, there was a man, he, he, he kind of been more than about five feet, and he had a sack on his back which was about three feet above his head. And he had a band round his head, uh, and the sack was, was uh, fitted like this into his back, right into the pit of his back like this, and it was leaning back, and this strap went round his forehead onto the sack, and he was coming down with a staff in his hand. And the man that with me said, well, there's a, there's a, a fellow that has a, <laughs> a real burden, hasn't he? I said, yes, he has. Uh, how far will you carry that? Oh, I should say, let's see, 120, 150 miles. 150 miles? How much will it weigh? Oh, I think 120 pounds, maybe. Well, the man doesn't weigh 120 pounds. How does he carry it up? Why, why is the sack so big? Because it's filled with a, with a kind of lichen. It, it's a flower that grows on the rocks, way up on the hills, and he has to stand on his hands and knees like going on those peaks, and he takes off all the different colored flowers, and he presses them into that sack, they dry, and he puts them into the sack, and then he has 120 miles to walk. Do you know how he starts off? He, he starts off sitting on a rock. Uh, a fellow helps him to put this thing into the pit of his back. He puts a rope on with a band here. He doesn't hold it with his hands. And just before he gets up, they put a rock on top of this huge 120 pounds that he has. They put another rock weighing 40 or 50 pounds. And then they help the man to stand up. And then they, they, they let him walk, you know, they see he walks all right for a while, and uh, he goes for a while, and then when his legs begin to ache, he shakes like that, and lo loses the load off, the other 50 pounds, and he loses, he's got nothing on his back. He changes over to another set of muscles. And, and he walks all that way, but this is the only way they know how to die things. Now they must have learned that in, in the scripture, because Remember Libya, it was a cellar of purple. The rich man that died, he, 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 he had purple. It was a distinctive sign. Uh, they had class distinctions then as, as they have now. But again, you see, in, in the, when it comes down to the nitty-gritty, you can really bear burdens, I don't care if it's ten times bigger than that man had in the, in the spiritual sense. The thing that eats us up, I, I don't think it's mental problems so much, it's, it's where are we in our, our, our spiritual relationship? If you have no inward foes, if, if you find it's very easy now, it used to be easy to get irritated, it used to be easy to show anger, it used to be easy to show opposition, but now you find there's a tremendous reversal of that, and you just find it's as easy to be forgiving, it's as easy to be gentle, it's as easy to be kind. 
Now Saul had a garment on that I'm sure was well dyed. And as a man stood at the other side of the valley in the morning in the light, and he said, Hey, whose is this? Whose is this? Who? Oh, mercy. King Saul. Well, shouldn't that man be put to death that fell asleep watching the king? We're supposed to be guarding the most amazing man in the world. The man with the most power. Look, I came into your bedroom last night. I came into your sleeping quarters. You see my sword? I could have put it through your heart. I could have slit your throat. You delivered it into my hands, but I showed mercy. Well, that's a very rare kind of mercy, isn't it? What about the other case? You know, there are two perfect characters in the Old Testament, as far as I understand it. One is Daniel. I, I think it's beautiful to read the story of Daniel. Have you read it lately if you haven't read it? Well, even the, 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 the God, the, the man who had healed God, and he lived like the devil, and so did his wife. And yet she said in, in trouble, you know, when they couldn't solve the, the mystery of the writing on the wall, when the king was having nightmares, oh, she said, there is a man in the nation in whom the spirit of the holy God lives. Isn't that something? That in a heathen court they recognized there was a man with the holy spirit of God inside of him. Well, that ought to be true of us. I remember a place called Doncaster in England, and, and we were out cycling out there when we were, we were not too old. And, and here was a bank, and I, uh, we said, well, what, what, what's inside of that place? And we, we climbed up, and there was a kind of a muddy hole, or um, a pond, something like that. You know the pond when you go down 16 past Dave Wilkinson's, and on the right there's a, uh, a lake. It's only two or three feet deep. <coughs> Excuse me. And just now the water lilies, the pads are coming up. And soon you'll have those big white flowers on top of all that scum and pshh, horrible. And yet they show their beauty better because they're framed in all that rottenness, all that corruption, all that water that looks as black as ink. Well, isn't that why God puts us in this world? Isn't it that God wants to show his grace through us in the same way? Daniel is a, is a character that's referred to twice at least by the heathen queen as a, a man in whom the holy God lives, the spirit of the holy God. And the other per perfect character is Joseph. Joseph lives up here. His father sends him down to Dalton to his brothers with some food. And they take him and put him down in a pit. And the Ishmaelites take him and, and take him down into Egypt. And when he gets down into Egypt, they put him down in the pit. And when he gets down in the pit, the bottom falls out of the pit and leaves him. He prayed for his companions to get out, the baker and the, the butcher, whoever they were. And they got out and left the man of God in jail. You'll never find a word of complaint in the life of, jo uh, of, of, of the young fellow. I, I think he was about 17 years of age when, when he was dragged out of his home, when he, when he was sold to the Ishmaelites. When he, uh, and again, it's easy, isn't it easy to sit in these nice chairs and say, yeah, he was a slave. Poor guy, eh? <laughs> You just take a coke right now. <clears throat> uh, all in one bed. Hmm? A slave. What, what do you think they did? Put him in an uh, uh, air-conditioned camel outfit? They possibly tied him to a camel. He had to tread every inch of that road, kicking up dust, spinning out the dust. See, he's not a worse than animal. And he has not. There's no word of complaint ever in the life. Just as there's no word of complaint in the life of Jesus is the most perfect example, I think, of Jesus in the Old Testament. And so he goes into prison. It's down, 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 down into Dalton, down into a pit, down into Egypt, down into prison, down. The other guys get out, he's left there, and he says nothing about it. And then there comes a time of crisis, and God begins to put him up, and up, and up, and up, until when the king goes out of town, he says, well, here you are, here are the keys of the kingdom. Uh, you just look after the place. Put a chain of gold around his neck. Look, here's a simple lesson. If you can learn it, it should hurt you for the next 60 years if you're going to live. Well, just Daniel's going to live 60 more years, but uh, Daniel, but anyhow, uh, uh, however long it is, 60 days or 60 hours or 60 what? Do you know why? You don't have to do one thing in your life 
to promote yourself. All you have to do is obey God. If God wants you on the top rung of the ladder, you'll get there if all hell opposes you. And if God doesn't want you there, you'll get to the top and you'll fall over the top. Neither men nor devils can keep you if the, the key is obedience. Now I figured that he was 13 years of age well, when, when he was taken away from home, uh, 17 years of age, and he was 30 years of age when he came into power. So was Jesus, so was John the Baptist. Again, in the Old Testament, a man could not be a high priest, he could be a priest at 25, he could not be a high priest until he was 30 years of age. Now what happened? Well, here's the little boy that went through all the hardship and all the trial, he, he lived as a slave, he was forgotten, and suddenly he gets into power, and then there's a strange situation. Uh, he has wisdom, he says, you know what I think? We're getting some bumper crops, why don't we do, pull down our barns and build greater? Which is right, if God tells you, that not, uh, if you do it like the man in the New Testament. And so they built great storehouses. He said he had ten years. Oh boy, he had vision, hadn't he? Well, he had interpretation, he had foreknowledge. Those those old boys had a lot of dreams. I wonder what they drank before they went to bed. They're always dreaming those kings in the Old Testament. Uh, come over here, George. I want to tell you something. Um, I was dreaming the other night. There were some cows. Uh, my, my, my cows were going down to the water edge and my cows were lean, very, very, very thin. And there were some fat cows there. And my cows not only drank water and grass, they went and ate up the other cows. And you know what? When they'd eaten them up, they were all fatter than when they started. Mm -hmm. What's the interpretation? So he gives the interpretation. And because of his wisdom, he was promoted up and up and up and up and up. And he grew a beard, and he, uh, because he was a deputy for the king, he wore kingly garments. And his brothers came up one day, and he said, uh, well, of these men just bring them in here, and I want to see them privately. I think you're spies. Oh, no, 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 Your Excellency, we're not spies. Well, how many are there of you? Oh, and he gives a number, was it twelve? And, uh, oh, you, you, you've got it, uh, twelve brothers all together at home. Uh, no, one of them is missing. Oh, oh we, we have a younger brother, Benjamin. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And your father must be an old man. Yeah, is he alive? Yes, how is he? He's fine, Your Excellency. Oh, we're, we're, we're not spies, Your Excellency. We, we've just come down to buy food so we won't die. All right. we we'll get away with it. And the second time, I think it was, I didn't check the story tonight, but remember that they were going around the second time, and the, 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 Joseph says, uh, put every bag of money in the mouth of the sack, and let them get away for half a day, and then chase after them and say, the king's uh, money's missing, and some of you have stolen it. Well, they had a lot of tricks up their sleeve in those days, didn't they? And they went, they found they had the money. They leave the younger brother. Oh no, no, no. One man offered to be a ransom. To finish the story, we went there and finally they go to the king. As they think to the king, and he orders everybody out of the room and says, Every one of you, my bodyguard, disappear. And they thought, Oh man, we're going to be executed. Can you imagine how their tummies had more than butterflies? I guess they thought they'd have heard of elephants inside. They were <sighs> feeling so bad. Why does this happen? Remember when we treated our brothers so badly and we didn't show any mercy? And now we're only going to get mercy because we didn't show mercy, we won't get mercy. Then the king of the God took his crown off and took his coat and he came and revealed that he was their brother. I guess we all thought now he's going to put us in prison. We put him in jail and there was nothing against him. And we lied about him to our daddy. We told daddy that he was devoured with wild beasts and we showed him that fancy coat and we've got the whole thing and the whole thing's going to be revealed now. But again, you see the mercy of Joseph. He had everybody under his control. What did he do? Did he exercise his authority with terror? 
we could have sent them all to jail, we could have put them all to death. Instead of that, he shows mercy. Well, he had not even received mercy, at least not from them. And again, with what measure you meet, the, the next chapter says, with what measure you meet, it shall be meted unto you again. Look in Philemon, and that's a book we don't use too often, isn't it? Have you heard a sermon on Philemon? Have you heard it for a long while? It's a short book. I'm sure you've not read the second chapter, because there isn't one. There's only one chapter. And what does it say? In verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. Aren't you glad your father didn't call you that name? Eh? What would he have called you for a nickname? What a short name. Hmm? You call a fellow Albert, you call him Al, we, we, we call everybody's name down. I don't know how you give it. Why they give us names, do you? Because if you have a name, nobody uses it with your pet name. Or a stupid name, or a nickname. What would they call an Esimus? Ollie? An Esimus, I have begotten in my bonds. Okay. Look what it says in the 18th verse. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on my account. Now, if that isn't showing mercy, and showing compassion, and showing grace, what is? Mercy never takes advantage of anybody else's misery. Mercy never comes with an accusing finger. Mercy is a composition again, I believe it's an outflow of love. Love is a main attribute. Mercy is, is an outflow of that love. Compassion, tenderness. Well, you can talk all that you like about culture, but there's not much tenderness around, there's not much mercy around, there's not much compassion around. There's not much gentleness around. And again, as we said, this this these attributes are actually they they they're like the well, the skeleton of your body, they like the very foundation of the life of Jesus Christ himself. Everything that's, that's revealed here in the, in, the, in the relationship of man to man and man to God was all condensed in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you ever in a situation where somebody could really have given you a whipping or, or they could have done like the man in scripture, right, you owe me what? You owe me ten dollars and I tell you what, I'm going to remind you every day you live that you're going to pay that ten dollars back, not nine dollars and ninety-eight cents or ninety-nine cents, ten dollars. As a matter of fact, thinking you don't, it's going to be eleven because of inflation. Or some of you say, well, look, oh, look I, I, I don't really need that money now, I'm in a happy situation, uh, I'd be quite willing to, uh, to forget it. I remember once when Dr. Fawcett, who was a senior pastor in the church where I was in Oldham, in Dalton, England, and he told me he was going away for the weekend. Well, I hadn't done much preaching at that time, that was 1932, I guess. Late 1932. And we had a crowded church. He was a, maybe the most loquacious man, that is, he was a great orator, one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard. And I knew the church would be packed. It was always packed. <coughs> Didn't matter who preached, the church was always packed. And mercy, I had not just to get a Sunday morning so, a meeting, uh, a message, I had to get a Sunday night message, twice, on a guy that wasn't used to preaching. Well, I got through the Sunday morning all right. <coughs> Sunday night, I remember, I preached on it once, never preached on it again. Not because I had a bad time, I felt I had a pretty good time that night. I preached on if he will not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. Well, there were a few people who came forward from prayer at the end of the meeting. I got to the door, shook hands with everybody, which was our custom, and a lady who was the best known lady in the, in the area. She read it for me. She weighed about 300 pounds. Could have the missile. And she was furious. Her face was red. And I put my hand out and said, well, good night. And she said, it's not good night. <clears throat> I want to talk to you. I said, all right. Help me. Oh, no, 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 not here, she said. Not here. In the church office. 
and said, well, then you'll have to wait till I've seen all the congregation. So we waited, all the congregation went away, and I said, let's go to the church office. I walked down through the church, opened the door, and then she came. I said, take a chair. No. I said, I'm going to sit down. I sat down, and she, 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 she shut And uh, I said, go ahead now, what's the trouble? What's the trouble? What's the trouble? Good. You don't know, eh? I said, no, I haven't the slightest idea. You haven't the slightest idea. Yeah, she said, you, you held me up like that for ridicule in front of the congregation tonight. Now you don't know. Her name was Crook, by the way. I said, Mrs. Crook, I, I never thought of you. Oh, now don't lie about it. What do you say about Duncan? Everybody knew you meant me. Yeah, I was What did you say about hurting people? What did you say about sin? Oh boy, she, she, she never had more of the sermon than I had. She put more into it. I said, I wasn't thinking, oh yes you, oh yes you. Well, I just want to tell you this. I haven't spoken to my neighbor on this side of the house for five years, and I got a hell before I spoke to speak to her again. And I haven't spoken to my neighbor on this side. I had a fight with her three years ago. And this woman hasn't spoken for five years, and this for three years, I tell you again, I'll go to hell before I speak to either of them. I said, well, you go to hell, I'm going to bed. <laughs> you said, what? <laughs> I said, you go to hell, I'm going home to bed. You said, I said, I didn't write the book. That's what God says, if you won't forgive, you can't be forgiven. There's no way. If you won't show mercy, you can't have mercy. <coughs> And just because you show mercy, because a bad person shows mercy to another, doesn't mean that they inherit eternal life. It means that when this has worked out in our lives, when we've humbled ourselves before God, and, and cried, God be merciful to me, I'm poor and needy. And when I've mourned over my sin, and when I've been evidence that I'm thirsting for righteousness, it's not some emotional thing I'm doing. It's that God has wrought His Spirit, God who is rich in mercy, as Paul says, is evidence in that mercy in me. I do not struggle to live the Christian. I'm not here to control the Christian life in me. The Christian life in me should control me. It should control my actions, control my speech. It should be an automatic outflow. Well, I said, Mrs. Cook, if you won't forgive them, God won't forgive you. Again, she said, I've got a hell before I forgive. I said, well, Mrs. Cook, would you please let me go home? Well, she didn't move, and you can guess I wasn't going to try and shift her. She stood with her back to the door, and she was bleeding. Her face was red with anger. I said, Mrs. Cook, I came to the prayer meeting in the church at 7 o'clock this morning. I preached at 11 o'clock. I came back, and I took the men's meeting at 3 o'clock and I preached tonight, and I really am tired, I would like to go home. But she didn't budge. She just stood there. Well, I said, all right, so I stretched my legs out, you know, and I just put my hand down like this, and uh, I didn't know whether she'd crown me or kick me or pick me up and break me in two or what. I didn't know what she was going to do. And then I heard some a thud like that, and I looked, and there this monstrous woman was at the side of me, on the knee. She had a big handbag. And she started cleaning it out. Oh, mercy. I thought, what a place. Late Sunday night in church, here the old girl. She put out cigarettes, she put out matches, she put out lipstick, she put out... Buy tickets for the movie house. You bought a, you know, a whole bunch of them, ten at a time, and got them reduced. And she put those out. And she put, she put everything. I said, Mrs. Crook, it's late Sunday night. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I. It's, her eyes were just. I hadn't noticed the sobbing, but her face was all wet. Now if you get an answer, she said, Preacher, if I'm coming to Christ, I'm coming clean. I don't want cigarettes. I don't want lipstick. I don't want movie tickets. 
I don't want all this junk. I want to be a real Christian. I want to show mercy to others. She went home and told her husband <laughs> that she'd been saved. Oh, mercy. She might as well have told him she'd found a, a cube of, all, a, 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 of gold, you know, ten feet long by ten feet by ten feet. He said, you, you, what? You've been up to the tabernacle, huh? Yeah. Oh. Well, you know, instead of being the mouse that got kicked around, he became a lion. He started getting, you know, about ten years of this, you're going to get it back. I mean, he, she never showed mercy. He wasn't going to show it. He started punching her and giving her back. About three months after that, she went home one night, and she said about two o'clock in the morning, she said, um, oh, I was crying. And he woke up and said, Annie, are you crying? Yes. Well, he'd never seen her cry in his life. He didn't believe she could, you know, he thought she'd have to take lessons. She never cried for anything or anybody. What are you crying about? Oh, Ravenhill preached to get... Oh, yeah, Ravenhill, tabernacle, huh? Yeah, but Dr. Fawcett was saying Ravenhill preached. He preached on hell. He did? Yeah. Hmm. And he said that uh, the wicked should be turned into hell and people that have never taken Christ in their lives will go to hell. And amongst other things, hell is a place where there's no mercy, there's no love, there's no gentleness, there's no peace. It's the very opposite of heaven. Oh well, go to sleep then, you see. You're going to heaven, aren't you? Yeah. Well, go to sleep. No, I can't. Why can't you sleep? You're going to heaven, everything's all right. Because you're going to hell. Now, I don't know how she, ended, she explained this. She said, you know, we've had a pretty happy marriage. That's the last thing I'd have thought about that marriage. But anyhow, she said, I, 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 I. And he said, will you go to sleep? And she said, an hour after he woke again and said, are you still crying? Yeah. Well, what are you crying about? I'm all right. No, you're not all right. We're going to part company. I'm going up into God's presence. You're going to be lost forever and ever. There's, there's no hope. Ah, he's got us. Forget all about that. At least two stuff. A third time he woke up. And then a third time he told he was shot. She was at our house the next morning at nine o'clock. There's no bus there. And I said, she didn't have a lady. When I got to the door, her face was red as beef and she was all perspiring. Mr. Ray, I need to talk to you. I said, well, Mrs. Come in, come in, Mrs. Uh, what was the name? Crook. I said, take this easy chair. Let me make a cup of tea. Mr. Fawcett's out just now. Let me make a cup of tea. No, I, I just wanted to say, I guess you didn't hear the news. No, no. And then she told me what I just told you. But she said, the fourth time, instead of me waking him up, he woke me up. And she said, I didn't know that he even knew it was there. See, the door I, I felt was a whiff, and, and you know, they slept in a cold room, and the, that many blankets on, they, they threw the blankets over, and she said, he jumped right over the end of the bed, and fell down in the corner, and, and, and raised his hands and started crying, and told me, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, be merciful to me, a sinner, be merciful to me, a sinner. I said, well, that's wonderful. My, she said, you know, I thought of the night when I, argue with you and, and if I hadn't asked God to have mercy on me he wouldn't be asking God to have mercy on him I'd still be fighting I'd be beating him up I'd be the biggest drunkard I knocked a cop out in a tavern and when the tavern keeper came in I stood behind the door and he says where's that Mrs. for Mrs. Crook and he says you know, like that and there were two of them laid out that was a hobby knocking people out I'd still be doing that but the, 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 the fact that night that God had mercy, and here's my husband crying, God be merciful to me a sinner. I can't believe it. Well, they lived happily ever after, which was about two months. She was at the door again one morning. 
nine o'clock. I just got to Monday morning. Tears rolling down the face. Oh, please come in. I, 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 I asked her to do a job. I said, what, what? You didn't hear the news? No. Well, you know, John, he went to the coal mine last night. You know what they do in coal mines? Is that as they cut the, and the, the coal out as they go forward, they put props like uh, railroad ties to hold the roof up. They started using steel props because they were stronger and the miners wouldn't have them. Do you know why? Because once that, that roof starts to sink like that, the, the props they're leaning on begin to creak. They go, you know, uh, uh, like this. Steel won't do that. It's safer. No, it's not safer. There's no warning with steel. He was digging coal. He was to be out of the coal mine at six in the morning. At ten minutes to six, that roof came in and squashed him like that into pulp. And she said they had to scrape him up and they brought him in a sack and put the sack in a casket and see that they wouldn't even let me see him. And she said, you know, I, I have such a strange feeling. She said, one minute, I think, well, here I am, I'm a widow and I've three children to raise. The next minute, she said, I feel I'm way up there, a million miles in the sky, and he's walking with the redeemed in heaven. He said, all because I said I'd show mercy. Because, you see, I told that woman when she got up, I said, now listen, God has given you mercy. You've got to go next door and tell the woman. To go next door. She came to the midweek. We had a holiness meeting. We used to preach just on holiness one night a week. She said, mm-hmm. I went to my neighbor. And she wasn't in. <laughs> <laughs> So she said, well, I've done my duty. It's not my fault. I came and she wasn't in. And I went to my other neighbor. And she wasn't in either. And she said, they still do the same. They, and they see me go. They call the kids and come on, she's coming. Come on. And I can hear them blocking the door when I go past. I said, it won't do. God won't take any substitutes. You've got to face that situation. And you know, she went back later in the week. Knocked on the door. The woman must not have seen her go past the window. She would never have opened it. She'd just about as much need a dragon. And she said, I, I, she said, excuse me, please, put a foot in the door. <laughs> I want to tell you something. No, I don't want to see you. I want to tell you something. I'm not the same woman. I went to the tabernacle, well everybody knew the tabernacle, we'd have a revival in the f- place where Finney used to be, nobody been in that area for, I don't think over 50 years, and we took a tent, nobody knew us, packed it out, the girls go to, 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 to work in the morning, they have what they call clogs, like those saddles that they wear, you know, in, uh, those wooden clogs that they wear up in Holland there, New Holland and Michigan and, and in Holland, and, and these clogs of wood, they're turned up and then round the edge, they have about a quarter of an inch of, of iron so that you're walking on the iron instead of walking on the, on the sole of the, of the, of the wood doesn't wear out. And you know those girls would come down the street, oh we, we weren't usually up at that time, six o'clock in the morning, we were going to bed at half the twelve o'clock at night, we were still working on a building we were erected. And you know those girls would come trippity clock, trippity clock down the street, six o'clock in the morning and, and they'd, they'd be singing, you know, some great old chorus. So the newspapers took it up national newspapers to get what what's happened in a community where <coughs> everybody goes singing to work at six o'clock in the morning when it's raining or snowing and, and it's dark and everybody's as happy as can be so they sent out an investigation and you know that woman became an outstanding character all based on the first fact that god offered her mercy she in turn got compassion she never had any compassion for her husband all she had was bad words and punches and all the rest of it. But having received the mercy and the grace of God, she wanted it to manifest in her life and as a result of her submission and gentleness, she not only won her husband, she won her children. That whole neighborhood taught. Do you remember what it says that, was it in the 11th chapter, I think, of John, where it says people came not to see Jesus, but to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. 
And that one of the most attractive things in the world is, is to see people totally redeemed by the grace of God. Totally transformed. When everybody else gives up, that benevolence of God, that mercy of God, that compassion of God. And if the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, we're going to have compassion whether people deserve it or not. They may be the most ugly, brutal, wretched, reprobates in the world. But someone inside of you says, you know, to use an old cliche, there go I but for the grace of God. You know, there's not a sin in the world you're not capable of committing if God doesn't restrain your life, including murder, rape, any devilish thing you like. The possibilities are there. But you know, when God has cleansed us, when, when this begins to become our natural life, when the outflow of Christ is gentleness and meekness and goodness and temperance and faith, then you don't have to look at somebody, you know, that ideal man you have in your life, you read his life story, something, and you say, well, there he is, he's uh, the tallest man I've ever seen, and I can't aspire to that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. He didn't have a bigger Bible than you have. He didn't have a bigger Savior than you have. He didn't have a bigger Holy Spirit than you have. But there has to be the input before they come to the output. I've obtained mercy, says Paul. Did, it, did he ever, in, was a life ever more invested for God than his? How he worked it out. In season and out of season. In prisons, in wilderness, in fasting. He just challenges all the powers of darkness. He just says, well, try all you can to break me if you like. They never broke his spirit. They never broke his faith. They never broke his love. There's no other way in the whole world that we can transform this wicked age in which we live except this redemptive work of God is made real in us by the Holy Spirit. The possibilities of grace are the same for every one of us. Well, I won't be here next week. I guess we're going off tomorrow and uh, we'll be away for... Uh, we'll be back, let me say, when we come back. <laughs> I know it sounds better or worse. Uh, the 10th of June. This weekend I'll be preaching to... Uh, some preachers and, and a lot of students are uh, in Fort Lauderdale and then on Monday we'll hop over to the Bahamas and have some rest and do some night as well. Shall we pray? <coughs> Our Father, we're so glad that <coughs> this fabulous experience of being redeemed and cleansed and filled with the Spirit is not for an isolated few. It's not for those who've had a good background and always walk clean and upright, always kind of love the things that are pure, but it's for those twisted, tormented, defeated, broken lives that you can put together, no one else can put them together, lives that the blood can cleanse and nothing else can cleanse. We bless you for the power of the gospel. And ask you, Lord, that since you've been so merciful to us, that mercy may flow from us. You've been so patient with us, may we have patience with others. You've been so forgiving, may we find it easy to forgive. You've been so loving, help us to be strangers to hatred and bitterness, and that real love may be shed abroad from our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Keep a good hand upon us. We pray for the magazine or the newsletters it goes out, the new one that loves your blessing and anointing will be upon it, and that Jesus will be glorified in all our lives. And we give you praise in his name.